Anthony Martin, DeWitt, Iowa, 1982. I was born in DeWitt, but I grew up in Germany for several years. My dad was active duty Air Force, and he got stationed off at Air Force Base. I was there when the Berlin Wall fell. I remember everything. We had to go in our building, our houses, and what we had issued to us, and no one can go outside or anything because they thought it's going to be hostile. My dad was an MP at the time, so he was on duty. Well, since my dad was Air Force, it was very classy. We had nice equipment, parks, and everything like that. So it was a lot of movement, though. Since my dad was MP, we got moved a lot, quite a bit. So it was kind of make friends, move. Make friends, move. Oh, we're going to a different school district. Okay, move. So it was kind of the whole military life came natural to me <laughs> when I joined the military. So seeing my dad in uniform and stuff, and my uncle served. Both of my dad's brothers served and my mom's siblings all served, so I was always around either National Guard or active duty. And to me, it was, I guess, in my blood, you serve, you know, faith and country and stuff like that. So I just went in there and I joined at 17. I had no clue. When I got in the Army, and I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. So I switched MOS, and about the time I was IR and went into, the guard, the guard offered me, it was at that time they are offering $15,000, $20,000 bonus to re up in 2006, 2000 time frame. And so I graduated 9 11. My battle buddy at the time, we all got assigned basic training battle buddy. Um, September 11th happened, we didn't know what happened. Well, obviously, we were in FTX at the time, and I got called into the office, and it was not no commander's office, it was the colonel and command sergeant major's office. Brought me in, he goes, so-and-so is your battle buddy. And I was like, yeah. He goes, flips on the TV and shows me. His mother, grandfather, father, um, his siblings were in the daycare there. We're all in the tower at the time. He goes, where he doesn't know it yet, you're gonna have to be his buddy. You have to watch him. We're gonna put him on suicide awareness and everything like that. And we're like, okay. And this is all new to us. We're 18 years old, never been around that type of information. And so I had to watch him 24 seven and stay by him. And every time we go to the train or whatever, I had to go with him. And they gave him the option to stay in or get out. And he got out. We got deployed. Went to Italy for two years and came back to the States and Iraq kicked up. Couldn't change MLS. It was a big thing. They wouldn't let me change MLS or anything and cross leveled or anything, so I was like, I'm done. You know, it's not like I didn't want to fight or anything like that. It was we weren't doing it. We weren't getting deployed. So it was like why stay in, what, you're, I'm just babysitting, I'm just going for another country to another country to another country, why, why, it's not what I want. That night, I really wanted to go to school. Once I got into Iowa Guard, it changed. I was doing my job. I was doing what we're supposed to be doing. I was serving my country. I was a mechanic and I was a 44 Bravo, LI Trades, and recovery wasn't real big in the military at the time, the Army. And so they cross-leveled everybody. Started cross all the medics. My team, they put me in NCOIC of eight guys. The Army wasn't prepared for it, and the National Guard wasn't prepared for it. We kept on saying, because we had that six month demo or mob down in Mississippi, and we kept on saying, can we get one of these vehicles? Can we work on it? We're going to fall in on it, but no one knew what our missions was. And so when we hit country, we had to learn everything. We got two weeks right seat, left seat. We went out, literally, I was in the country two days, and I was going on my first mission. Didn't know what I was doing, didn't know how to work anything on the vehicle, and we jumped in it, and we had to learn it. We got in country, and, and we just jumped on it and went to work. Take your civilian wrecker. You can get pulled over on the side of the vehicle, your vehicle gets damaged, or you need a towed. That's what we were, but we rolled with the whole element. 
Every time they rode, we either had to deal with civilian vehicles breaking down, either fix them, or we had to pull them out into the desert and blow them up. Um, to military vehicles getting hit by IEDs, us being targeted, to um, small arms fire, you, pretty much the whole conflict of war. Great coordination, report, vehicle down, then all of a sudden we got to that vehicle, got another grid, coordination that was two clicks down, another vehicle down, then we heard company, or, uh, company vehicle, commander's vehicle down, six is down, his vehicle was down, he had blown two tires and we had to get to that vehicle, so by the time we got to the commander we had two vehicles already tied up, and we got the call, small arms fire, casually down, man down. And we are like, what? And couldn't get any support because where they were was over by the Rupa area of Iraq. And we couldn't get any support. And they were, get, they were out by themselves for a while. Two guys got killed. And by me, I had six vehicles down. So I blamed myself for many years, almost 10 years, that they died because they ain't going to get the support because I couldn't get their vehicles up. In reality, Superman couldn't even do it. So I know I've dissected, been through the PTSD treatment and everything else, but I still have that. Everything I do, go, 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 go. Let's get the mission done, get out of my way. It even got to the point of conflict in my military career because I experienced it. I knew how they react, and if you didn't react properly, people will die. And so I had a lot of issues and stuff like that, and like company commander, first sergeant knew it, but they knew I was the guy to go to and get it done, and get it done, and get back, type things. But I've had a couple people talk to me when I was over there, hey, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't know it was that conflict. That was just totally eating me out. I started identifying signs and stuff like that. I went and talked to a psychologist and stuff like that. Then they said, no, nothing's wrong with you. And the PTFD wasn't really big in that time frame, those years. And I got out, used that positive, energy, but it was negative energy. I got into the union, carpentry, started doing that, going to school, apprenticeship school and everything like that. Started going fine, extending. I was always volunteering for hours and everything like that. I had to stay busy. I couldn't sit still in my house or alone or anything like that. Started drinking and stuff like that. And then we got the call saying we're going overseas. We went from doing recovery to nothing to all of a sudden we have to do a recovery from another division on a different province type thing. And so it was different than going from being someone guy who was on the front line all the time to being stuck, confined and listening to it. Like I'd see the raid camera, we'd be watching it because we had a meeting every month, every uh, week, day. We'd go on there with the commander and the first sergeant and all of a sudden the raid camera comes over and his IED just went off. You just see your guys get blown up and you're waiting to get that call, I'll go out there and help them and you get no call. You're just sitting there watching the whole thing. And you can feel that aggression, gotta go, gotta respond, let's go, go, go. But you have to sit there and watch it. And it, it killed me for a while. And we finally went out there and it was kind of, I naturally reacted like I was supposed to, but deep down I knew no one reacts like that. And so we did it and we got back and I was still, shaky and stuff like that and well this guy is good but deep down it was that whole incident back in Iraq I was reacting the same way faster so the longer I'm out there it takes for us to recover everything they're more in hostile area. Afghanistan 2011 I was on top of a vehicle and a round came in you can hear it take off I jumped down my spine completely collapsed I sustained s severe injuries that I didn't know it was that severe or the medics didn't know it was until I got back to the States. They just said it was a chip vertebrae. And they said, you'll, you'll heal just light duty and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, you're the medic. <laughs> but I was on crap load of meds the whole time. And we got back to the States and they immediately evacuated me out to Washington State and they did an MRI and CAT scan and everything like that and said your spine's in two different positions. So it's, your normal spine goes down there, mine went like this, and it separated. 
And so we did the surgery and everything. They ended up fusing eight vertebrae. Six months later, they did hip operation. Then they did a hip enforcement a year later. Then they found out I had neck issues and my neck was completely crushed. It all came out and they said, you got PTSD. And I tried fighting it and went to the JAG lawyer and everybody. I was like, what is PTSD? What is this? Is this going to ruin my career? The colonel and the WTB I was in recovering because I sustained pretty severe injuries and said that being diagnosed with PTSD isn't a bad thing. It means you're alive and you suffered some kind of incident that's either life-threatening or knowledge in life that it's hard to dissect. Right at that time they said that you gotta have spine surgery, we don't know if you'll walk again, you'll be in a wheelchair for a period of time, you'll be in a cage and everything and he goes, you will not be able to serve your country. And it just kind of all came out and all I knew was to serve your country, be in the military, you know. And then they said they can't do it. It just came out. Everything just flashbacked and I had problems sleeping and and there. Some of the help was nice. Some of the help was really hard, probably extremely hard for me. You had to dissect it and break it down and talk about it and open up more. And the people I worked with was awesome. They were the psychologist, the social worker, everybody was great. So I went through all this treatment and everything for three years out in Fort Lewis. And I go back to Iowa and they had nothing. So I was like, what do I do with my life? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna live on with life? And so I knew I had to find something that would help channel the energy I have. This kid, sitting there watching him carve at the, the PX, and all of a sudden I started missing appointments and it just, I couldn't sleep. I'd always think about what he was doing and stuff like that, how he's doing, how is he's taking this log and turning it into an eagle or a bear or fish or whatever. How psychologically is he doing it? He's not stenciling everything. He doesn't draw anything on the log. How is he doing it? I started watching it and watching it. Like I said, I started missing appointments while this colonel pulled me in office because I was considered a high risk and my first sergeant was there and, and platoon sergeant was there and he's like, what's your excuse? Let's hear this story. And I was like, well, you keep telling me I need therapeutic counseling. This guy, the chainsaw carver, everybody knows who he was because he's there three days a week. Two hours later, the first sergeant, commander, and everybody shows up, and the commander's like, here's your first chainsaw. This guy's gonna come every Saturday for a month straight and help you learn. And he goes, if you need transportation, we'll provide it and stuff like that, and we'll get you set up. So he gave me a brand new chainsaw. My wife talked, my wife now, it was my girlfriend at the time, was like, I'm, I want to take you to the state fair. We went there and came across a chainsaw cart. And she's like, well, we'll go look at this. I'm like, I'm just going to sit here. I want to watch these guys. I'm starting to talk to this guy. And his name's Andy Clint. And he's actually real wide known for carving. And talking to him, I'm like, how do you feel about giving like a one-on-one -on -one session or something like that. I'm like, if you need to be paid, I'll pay you for your time and stuff like that. And he's like, he's like, yep, don't worry about it. Name and time and I'll show up. Well, he started coming out and everything. He started teaching me a little bit of stuff. And he's like, dude, I can't teach you. He's like, you have the talent. You just don't know it. You got to discover what you have. He goes, I see it. When you're carving, you're doing stuff that I do. I had to use my mind, think, okay, this is the shape of it. It was completely taking that PTSD and stopping it. I'm showing everybody else that you still can live with these injuries and you still can impact the rest of the community. And that's when I came up with Logs for Heroes.